Well, welcome everybody to uh, July's meeting of the Astronomical Society of Frankston. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Sutton, I'm the Chair of the Primary school, 
on the 23rd of June. We had St Michael's Grammar had a viewing night at the Briars Education Centre on the 3rd of July, and we also had a public night at the Briars on uh, American Independence Day, July the 4th. Uh, do we have any feedback on members' nights, uh, John? Two things to mention. The first of the July public nights, um, like the June one, that July one was much better. We, the weather was better and there was only patchy cloud that night. We had at least 30 people there and being school holidays we had quite a few kids along and uh, there were seven telescopes and a number of members. And Early on uh, we had a look at the moon and later on when Mars rose about 9.30 or 10, uh, a number of the public got a chance to see Mars and they're quite enjoying it. And also Pluto night report from last month. I couldn't make it to that myself. David Girling sent in a report. He said the night was very good. The cloud was there. It seemed to stay away till about 1.30 Sunday morning. He said that those there were Richard Pollard with his tweets refractor, Alec with his 8-inch Dobsonian, Alios with his 7-inch Neve Maxuda, and David was there with his new 10 inch LX200, and also Roger and Sally. And they said they looked for Pluto, but it was hard to identify. And they said also the highlight was Mars. And also, coming up, something I will highlight as it hasn't been or didn't make it into Scorpius was a telescope learning day and the lunar night on Saturday, August the 9th. So, if the weather's fine that night, so please come along. And we'll learn about observing the moon and Mars, and if it's clear, we uh, get a chance to take a look at it. And secondly, recently on East Scorpius, I mentioned the elevation image of Victoria map, and this map produced by the Victoria, what well, is actually a computer produced digital elevation model, it gives you a good, pretty good idea of how it would look like from space, and this is only $20 from my Victoria's also network. Uh, Ian, did you want to say anything about astronomy classes? Uh, yes, uh, you notice on the what's on there about the astronomy class at Mount Eliza Community Hall. We had a session last month. What we're going to try and do is we're going to run each month. Um, I'll assume that all or most of those who came last month will come again on Saturday. Uh, we could do with one or two more. We have to pay about $33, haven't paid yet, we've got to pay about $33 for the use of the room. So you need, um, you need about six people to, uh, to break even. So that's why it needs numbers. Uh, if anybody who is not on my list um, would like to come this Saturday, uh, or is interested but cannot come this Saturday, uh, want to give me your name and phone number, then I'll take it uh, tonight and notify you of the next one. It'll be in uh, late in August. It may be after the general meeting, it may not. It's a matter of I well, only notify the people, of course, who are on my, on my list. So if you're interested, uh, there'll be new stuff each month. So there'll always be someone who's come from last month and has got some work done, and then somebody new. So I have to make provision for new people every time there's a meeting, but I have to make provision for the people who've been before. So I've got to work the two and give people exercise to do and so forth. So he said it'll stand or fall on the basis of people interested. So uh, see, see me if you want to talk about that. Thanks, Ian. Right, well, uh, I'll leave the rest of my stuff until uh, after the tea break, uh, including details of uh, the uh, very bright occultations that we've had uh, recently and the results of that, and uh, show you some clips images afterwards as well. Uh, in the meantime, I'd invite uh, Barry Adcock, who's uh, Section Director of the Lunar and Planetary uh, Group of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, to uh, come and tell us all about uh, Mars and this uh, opposition.
Peter said that I was going to tell you all about Mars. Well, that's not quite true because I don't know all about it. Um, every two years and a, a month or so, we, we have a very favourable opposition of the planet Mars, and even though the spacecraft have, um, have uh, visited the place, and it's still a very interesting um, object in the sky to look at. And what I'd like to do is go through a few things and uh, tell you all about why this opposition is obviously so important. And they, it was a very simple contraption. They just walked around underneath it with an eyepiece and, and it would 
the sky. And that thread, or that uh, market thing there, going up to the, uh, to the lens is actually a silk thread. And if, by pulling that taut, that sort of marked the, uh, the position of the focus. Right, so um, Huggins was, <coughs> was able to look at Mars for that, and he made, well, that's, that's, uh, that's, the, the contraption still exists, and it's in a, a, a museum in, in England. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. But uh, they're the actual pieces of that telescope that, uh, that, that are still um, in existence. And Huggins made this um, very famous observation of Mars in uh, 1659, and I used Guide 8 to trace back the uh, observation, and sure enough it was, uh, was pretty accurate. That V-shaped feature that is, is one of the most uh, prominent features on the planet Mars, which is surface major. And uh, I found that on that particular night, the diameter was 17.1 seconds of arc, and, uh, and that's the way it looked. Huygens he followed on from Pavalis in that he, he was actually, with that telescope, he was able to identify the Saturn as actually having a ring around it. He, he was the first to, to really promote the, the true nature of the rings of Saturn. And shortly after that, Cassini was able to see the, the division in the rings. And he used a, a telescope similar to these as well. Of course, they used these very long telescopes to overcome the problem of chromatic aberration. In those days, they didn't have doublets or triplets or fluoride lenses at all. Right? They just had a single element of glass, and the glass was probably not, not all that good anyway. And they would ground these single element lenses with these enormous focal lengths to, to be able to uh, have a good look at the sky. For many years after that, astronomers, um, amateur and professional, made observations of Mars by drawing. And they made drawings typical, typical of those. Um, and they, from those, they constructed maps of Mars. Uh, not all of the diagrams were um, which full disk drawings. They, uh, some, some of them were very localized, detailed drawings. In fact, that top strip up there is of the, um, can you see that all right? That looks funny from here. The do with the lights off, the not it? Uh, it looks like it's too bright. It flows off, and then the other one does not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Seems to be washed out. Yeah, then it flows. Yeah. Can I touch the other one? Can we drop the brightness of the projector? Was that not? No. So bright, it seems to be washing out a bit of the detail, but um, I'll put my point here. This top row of drawings is an important area on Mars, and we'll talk about it later. later. That's the Solus Lacus region, and that is renowned for where dust storms start. And in fact, the dust storm has already started on Mars in that area this year, and has um, subsided. We'll talk about the dust storms later on. The other feature I want to point out is this third row. That's of a feature called Sinus Meridiana, that bit there, and Sinus Sabaeus. And Sinus Meridiana forms the, the zero meridian on Mars. It's Mars, Mars answer to Greenwich. And um, it's, it's really a, a perfect um, thing for that because it's almost on the equator of, of the planet and it has this fork type structure that, uh, that really defines where, where north degrees longitude is. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about those two features later on, but they're, they're important when we talk about um, how to find the, uh, what we're looking at. We can't go past the canal uh, era without mentioning it in some detail. Um, first of all, Lowell was um, originally at Yerkes Observatory, and then he set up his own Lowell, Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona. And in there, he had a 24-inch refractor, that one there, and that's a picture of Lowell looking through it, and he devoted his life to studying Mars. And he didn't beat around the bush, he, um, he constructed these, these diagrams. You can't see anything on that, can you? It's no canals. I can see plenty on the screen, but I can't very well turn around. I've got a slide on it, which I'll be showing after anyway. Okay. I'll go to the next one and see if that's better. Oh, that's a bit better. Yeah. 
A lot of the deep, I can't, I, can't um, I, I think the projector is actually too bright. It's, um, it's washing out a lot of the detail on the slide. But anyway, I, I wanted to point out these, um, these canals that he drew on all of his diagrams and the junction of the canals he drew with oases. Um, and he didn't muck around. He, um, he came straight to the point and he said that these were, were constructed by beings on Mars and the, the, the purpose of the canals was to channel water from the melting pole caps to the um, uh, areas, on, uh, areas on Mars where the, where the beings lived and this was done because the, uh, the drying up planet didn't have very much water at all. And he promoted this idea um, for, for many years. And of course it, <clears throat> it struck the imagination of the public. It was just what the public wanted to hear and it, it was perpetuated for, for quite a long time with the canals of Mars and the, and the Martians. Later came photography of the planet Mars and there are several very <coughs> famous telescopes around the world that took many photographs earlier on in the last century of, of Mars and that's, that's a picture of one of them, that's a picture of the 24 inch refractor at Pictivini Observatory in France and it was a folded refractor. The 24 inch lens is up there and the light would come down to an optical flat, it would have turned up to another optical flat there and then down to the plate holder or the eyepiece and it had many auxiliary instruments on the side of course to, to help line up and, um, and guide the, the telescope. But that 24 inch refractor at Pictivini Observatory is a very, very famous telescope. What was the effect in focal length? I think it was about f20. It was very long. It was was longer than the um, conventional f15. <coughs> I couldn't say for sure, Peter, but it, it, it was long. And with it, uh, many photographs of the planet Mars were taken with conventional film of uh, what we call wet chemistry these days. Yeah. I'll just mention briefly the spacecraft. The first one was Mariner 4 in 1965. I can clearly remember that. Um, I, was a, I was a student at that time and it, it actually flew past Mars on a, on a Sunday. And I sat in the kitchen all day and waited for news items on the radio to, 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 to come out with what was happening. And next day in the age, on the Monday morning, there were one of these pictures and it showed that Mars had craters all over it. It didn't take many pictures, it flew past Mars quite quickly and it just took perhaps 14 or 15 pictures of the very isolated areas as it flew past. <coughs> and, uh, a lot of people said, oh yes, I knew that there would be craters on Mars, but um, I don't know whether they do or not. But it, it took a lot of other people by surprise that it had so many craters, like uh, a little more, uh, more aged than the moon's craters, but, uh, over there anyway. We go right up to the present time. I'm not going to talk about the spacecraft in great detail, but that's, that's a view taken with the um, the letter. I've got my name. Of the Viking. No, 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 it's not Viking. It was the one that um, one of the Sojourner on board just recently. It bounced like a balloon. It bounced across the um, Pathfinder, Pathfinder spacecraft. In about 1996, took that picture of the planet, and um, at the moment there are half a dozen uh, spacecraft flying to Mars, and there's another half a dozen on the launch pad ready to go. So uh, there's, 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 over the next few months, there'll be a, uh, an invasion of the planet by uh, the space vehicles. Just looking at the, the planet itself. It's only about 60% the size of the Earth. It's not as, uh, not as big. It's, um, its diameter is 6,800 kilometres, whereas the Earth's around about 13,000 kilometres. Its surface gravity is less. It's only about 38% of the, the Earth's gravity. And it's less dense. The Earth has a much more concentrated <coughs> iron core than, than the other planets, including Mars. So it's den our, our density is higher than the, the other planets. 
the inclination of its axis to the orbit is very similar. The Earth is about 23 and a half degrees, as you well know, and Mars is just over 25 degrees. And its day is very similar as well. It's around about 24.6, 24 hours, 37 minutes. Uh, when Pathfinder landed on Mars, it took pictures continuously and it was really locked in with the Martian day and it was for the first time I realised that the Martian day is called a Sol, S-O-L. I don't know what the origin of the term is, but they talk about Sol 1 and Sol 2 and Sol 3 instead of day 1, day 2 and day 3, whereas the day refers to the, to the Earth. So if you see that word again, it's probably referring to the planet Mars and its day. The atmosphere of Mars is not very inviting. In fact, if you just look at that um, briefly, it looks like Mars and Venus are pretty similar. Um, on Mars, there's a, a little bit of oxygen and water, um, water vapour, but not much. Most of the atmosphere is, is carbon dioxide. But of course, on Venus, the, the density of the atmosphere is very high, and um, <coughs> it, it's, a, it's a very, very hot place. The, um, greenhouse effect is completely taken over and temperatures in the order of five to 600 degrees centigrade on the surface of Venus, whereas um, Mars is, is, is the opposite, it's quite cold. Okay. That's a, a graph showing the, the temperature of the planet. Along that horizontal axis there is plotted the temperature and along the vertical axis is the altitude. And if we just concentrate on the surface, that's, that's good enough for the moment, uh, measured by various spacecraft, um, that's in, in Kelvin, uh, the degree is absolute. Um, it shows that um, the temperature of around about 240 degrees absolute is, is about as hot as you get in, in the areas where they were measured, measuring it, of um, Viking 1 and 2, etc. And that's around about minus 30 degrees, right? It's very cold. <coughs> minus 30 degrees centigrade. I think in other spots, it, um, very sensitive temperature measuring equipment has measured temperatures in the order of zero degrees, oops, zero degrees centigrade and above, but um, in general it's, it's very much colder. And to make it worse, the atmospheric pressure is very low. Now, along this horizontal axis is time in days, and that is a function of where Mars is in its orbit and, and, the, um, and the season. And vertically, it's, um, it's, it's a measure of pressure. And even at its best, it's only about 10 millibars, which is one hundredth of the um, of the Earth's atmospheric pressure. So it's uh, it, it's 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 not a place to be unless you've got some very elaborate life supporting equipment. We'll talk about this a bit in a minute. But the reason why the the um, pressure fluctuates so much is because Mars. Um, uh, comes closer to the sun and, and closer and further from the sun, much, much more so than the Earth does. Forgive me for saying, Derek, why are we then exploring Mars when it's possibly such a disaster? What, why, are we, what? why are we exploring Mars when it's such a disaster? Why are we interested in Mars? Not, not oh, I think there's, a, there's a, an interest in Mars because it's there. Um, now that you come and mention that, I, I, I think it'll be a long, long, long time before anyone ever goes there. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think there's always threats and talk about it, but I think when it really comes to the crunch, I don't think, it, I don't think it'll happen in our lifetime. Why, why do we carry on about it on Earth then? We're being involved in economy. It's probably because they reckon it might be, might, one day it might be better than what we've got here. Well, we're going to do better on what's here. <laughs> 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 then we wreck Mars. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> One of the features that spacecraft discovered on Mars were, were these huge volcanoes and it, it turned out that we can actually see these volcanoes with telescopes but we didn't know what they were. And this is a picture of um, <coughs> Olympus Mons which was originally called Nix Olympica and um, through a telescope you can actually see where it is by the lighter clouds that form around it and, and there are several of them. It, it's not the only one, there's, there's probably at least six or eight very large volcanoes, and if we have a little bit of tactical size, it's enormous. That's a picture of Olympus Mons in the background there, and there's Mount Everest and Mauna, Mauna Kea volcano in the, um, in the foreground, and um, the 
cul de sac at the top is, is nearly, it's from here to Geelong, wide. Mm. At the top, and, uh, and much, much higher than Mount Everest. Likewise, the Great Rift Valley on Mars, that's a picture of it there, um, discovered by spacecraft as they, as they flew by. It, it dwarfs the Grand Canyon. Right, the Valus Marinaris is 150 miles wide and four miles deep, and the Grand Canyon is just like a bit of a crack in the bottom of it. So it's, um, it's another feature that is, is, is quite amazing. Now, there's dozens of these things that we can look at. It's a very diverse surface the planet Mars, but that, that's just a typical area of which, which gives the indication that there's either been water or carbon dioxide or ice or, or something flowing through the areas around these um, winding little towns. <coughs> Some stage in the past, there, something has caused those, um, those uh, channels and, and by, the, by the flow of some sort of um, fluid. Most people say it's water. There's a, a guy whose name I forget at La Trobe University has done a lot of work to, to show that it could have been carbon dioxide that has caused the, the, uh, the pattern of um, valleys. And we go on for the area you've probably seen it on the internet and in books and things. They, uh, they, there's dozens of pictures like that. What I'd like to talk about now for a few minutes is just why this particular opposition is, is so close. And to do that, We've got to talk about the, um, the seasons of Mars and the, the orbit, uh, orbital shapes and things like that. And to do that, we've got to have a datum from which to measure things. And the datum that we use, if we look at the Sun and the Earth going around the Sun, the Earth goes around in a clockwise direction if we look down on the solar system from the north, which is a conventional way of looking at it. So we've gone up way up north and we're looking down on the solar system <coughs> and the Earth is, um, is rotating around there in an you know, anti-clockwise direction. The Earth's orbit is not round, it, it's a, an elliptical shape and that elliptical shape that I've drawn there is exaggerated. It's exaggerated a lot. So that um, we put the Earth in, in, in this position and that's the north pole of the Earth and I put it in that position because this is where the northern spring is starting, or the southern autumn is starting, on the 22nd of March. And this is the definition of the direction that I wanted to talk about. If we look at the sun at that time, it's said to be in the first point of Aries, which is no longer the case actually because of precession. But if the sun at this time is on the junction of the equator and the ecliptic, and that line there, that vertical line is nought hours right ascension and the equator is there and the ecliptic is there and where the ecliptic crosses the equator going north that would be the beginning of the northern spring and the beginning of our autumn that's defined as the, um, as the data from which I'm going to measure all these angles. There's the sun again, there's the Earth's orbit there's the Earth on the 22nd of March, and looking in that direction, that's the what, what we call the vernal equinox. It's actually our autumnal equinox, and the Earth orbit at that time, it, it, being an ellipse, its major axis lies in that direction, and its furthest point is up there towards two o'clock, and the closest point to the Sun is down here, and that occurred this year on January the 4th. January the 4th, the Sun was closest to the Earth, or well, the Earth was closest to the Sun. Now, that angle around there is important, and it's called the longitude of perihelion, and it's given the symbol omega, and it's around about 101 degrees. Now, I'm only putting these up because I want to compare them to, them to Mars in a few minutes, but if we progress on, there's the Sun again, the Earth's orbit, there's the major axis of the Earth's orbit, perihelion and aphelion. The perihelion distance is 0.9833 astronomical units, and the furthest distance is 1.0167 astronomical units. 
Now, this astronomical unit, of course, is the, the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun, and its modern definition is, is quite complicated. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the definition of the astronomical unit, but it is, as far as we're concerned, the mean distance from the Earth to the Sun. And it's from those two numbers, P and A, that we can work out this, this eccentricity. And the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, if you use that formula, it comes out to be 0.01675. And the smaller the number, the more round the, the orbit is. A perfectly circular orbit would have an eccentricity of zero. And in the case of Halley's Comet, which is a big, long, cigar-shaped orbit, that's got an eccentricity of about 0.85. So the Earth's orbit has got an eccentricity of 0.0167. And that's, that means it's quite circular. Mars, on the other hand, is, is, is different. Its perihelion distance is 1.3 odd, and its furthest distance is 1.66 astronomical units. And that line joining the perihelion and aphelion is called the line of the apsides. And the eccentricity of Mars orbit is a lot bigger. It's 0.0933. So it's, it's more elliptical than the Earth's orbit by a fair bit. And that means that. Um, at its closest point and its furthest point, the difference is much greater than what the Earth is. And the longitude of the helium, which we talked about before, is 334 degrees, and that defines its direction, which is important when we're talking about oppositions. That line there is called the, um, the line of the nodes, and it defines where Mars' orbit is, is inclined to the ecliptic, which is the definition of the Earth's orbit. And that line there shows us where, where, the, um, where the ecliptic, come, where Mars orbit comes out of the board. And I've used a, a dotted line to show that. That's, um, that's its longitude of the ascending node. Where the line is dotted there, that means it's underneath the, um, the, the screen. And where it's solid there, it's above the screen. Which means it's north of the ecliptic there and south of the ecliptic on the other part. But not by much, because the, orbit, the inclination of the orbit is only about 1.8 degrees. So it's, it's not a big inclination. Just the same, where Mars is closest to the Sun, it is south of the ecliptic, which, which is useful for us. The orbit of Mars again. This time we wanted to find the seasons of Mars. Before we talked about the season of the Earth, the Earth our spring, our summer, our, sorry, our autumn and the northern summer is when the Earth is down at the bottom there, as, as I drew before. In the case of Mars, the solstice line is, is almost vertical and its angle is 357 degrees, almost 360 degrees. And if we put Mars in its, um, in its, in, in its place, that's the Earth, the, the um, southern autumn, and Mars seasons are distributed like that. There's the northern, northern winter and the northern summer at the bottom, and there's the northern autumn and the northern spring over there as it rotates around in its orbit. So the, the Mars goes through seasons just like the Earth, but they're at a different time. On Earth, the Seasons are determined by the tilt of the Earth's axis because um, the, 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 the fact that the Earth comes closer and further from the Sun has very, influ very little influence on the, on the seasons. But that's not the case for Mars because the difference travel or the different difference between furthest and closest approach is so great. Um, we have the, the tilt of Mars orbit, sorry, the tilt of Mars axis <coughs> and its position in its orbit as well influencing the, the seasons. So we have um, the northern winter and the southern summers on Mars are much more extreme than the reverse because it's, uh, it's so much closer or further from the, uh, the sun. <coughs> I'll put the Earth there at its... Um, at, the, at, at, at its zero right ascension point. And in one year, it travels round the sun 
and that defines what we call a tropical year, that 365.25 days. Now, if we put Mars next to the Earth, at that point, they're said to be in opposition because the Sun, the Earth and Mars are in a straight line. And in one year, the Earth goes around its, um, its tropical year and Mars gets nowhere near around its orbit. It only goes around about 200 degrees. And if we progress further, by the time Mars has reached its, its year, which is defined as almost three, 687 days, Earth days that is, not Mars days, the Earth hasn't quite reached its second year. And for them to come together again in opposition, that's the next opposition, that takes 780 days virtually for, for, the, um, for the, the two planets to, to, to line up again with the Sun. So the first opposition was down there, the second opposition is over there 780 days later. And um, for that reason, every 780 days we get a close approach of Mars that creeps around its orbit. The first one was there, the second one is there, the third one will be out there, and the fourth one out there, and so on. And that's shown better on that um, scale diagram. There's the, the Earth's orbit in the middle. There's the Earth in March, the 22nd. There's January where it's <coughs> close to the sun. Mars orbit is drawn around the, um, around the outside. It's closest to the sun up there and furthest from the sun down there. And you'll notice that when Mars is closest to the sun, the Earth is almost furthest away. Not quite, but it's, it's getting on to being furthest away. So as these oppositions creep around the diagram, they end up being at a very close point and then they separate again. So that every 15 or 17 years, we get a very, very close opposition of Mars and that's what's happening this time. Except this time, it's about as close as it was, it, it's possible to get any time. So if, if we have an opposition, well, there's the 1986 one, that was pretty close, the 1988 was pretty close, but the 2003 opposition, <coughs> some um, natural phenomena, is, is as just about as close as we can possibly get. In 1997 and 1995, they were very unfavourable oppositions where the Earth was close to the Sun and Mars was furthest from the Sun and the difference between the two was very large. So that was, um, that was not a, a very good time to study the planet. So, excuse me, Barry, go on. Um, so then, Mars' perihelic opposition, is that the same as to say then that that's the closest it will ever get to Earth? I mean, perihelic opposition means that that's the closest, closest that it ever gets to the sun. But for yeah, but that's because Earth, um, that just happens to be, because the, the Earth's <coughs> orbit is so circular. In fact, the Earth, at the peri perihelic opposition of Mars, the Earth is actually furthest from the sun, almost. Right. But the two of those together means okay. that it is a yeah. very favourable opposition. Yeah. But you can still, when they mean a perihelic opposition, they don't mean the absolute maximum, they mean within a certain tolerance of, of a few days. And, uh, right. yeah. So the mean time between these oppositions is about 780 days, and um, favourable oppositions around that diagram, as I mentioned earlier, occur about every 15 or 17 years. But if you go further than that, it turns out that they fall into a, a pattern similar to the, to the eclipses of the Sun, the Saros series. And if we add up 15, 15, 15, 17 and 17, we get 79 years. And every 79 years, a pattern <coughs> um, uh, repeats itself. And that corresponds to 79 revolutions of the Earth and 42 revolutions of Mars. And the pattern that we're associated with at the moment is one that, um, well, it didn't start in 1845, but 1845 was one of them, 1924, 2003, 2082. And you'll notice that the 2003 one is the closest of the lot, but not, not by a lot, but it is closer. It's interesting that um, probably not many people in here saw the 1924. <coughs> 
But, but <coughs> when I was a boy, I used to read books about the 1924 um, opposition from Mars, and it, it was it was then hailed as the uh, as a very very close opposition. And of course, Lowell and his um, and his canals would have been in full swing at that time. And I'm sure 1924, the planet would have been um, very closely studied. That's a, um, a printout of a book of, of oppositions that started on the 30th of July in the year 21. Sorry, the year 30. 30. 30. Bear the years down there, and, and so on. But I don't want you to um, dwell on those too much, but I do want to have a look at the, um, the ones that I've highlighted. That's the 1924 apparition there, at a distance of. Um, 37285. There's the 2003 one, 37272 astronomical units. The next closest one is in the year 2287. It'll be actually closer. And the closer again is in the year 2729, which doesn't hold a lot of interest to us. <laughs> <laughs> if we have a closer look at these, though, the definition of the astronomical unit is 149. 597-870 kilometres, and the, that's defined by the International Astronomical Union, and it's accepted by everyone in astronomy that that's, that's the definition of the, of the astronomical unit. And if we multiply out these numbers, 1924, 1924 was 55,777 kilometres from us, and this time around it's going to be 55,758, which is just a little bit closer and the difference is 19,000 kilometres. So in 19, sorry, in 2003, Mars is 19,000 kilometres closer than it was in, in 1924. Now, as time goes on, the press are going to make a bigger and bigger meal out of all of this. It won't be long before we hear that Mars is going to be closer than the moon. <laughs> but you've got to bear in mind that it is a very, it's the closest opposition for about 60,000 years. It won't be closer again until the year 2287. But there are many, many, many oppositions in that time that are almost as close. Maybe even a few kilometres. And 1924 was one of them. Now if we go through the sums, oh, that's, that's the, um, the distance in, in the year 2729. Mars will be closer, that's the figure in 1924, Mars will be closer to 1924 from the 26th of August to the 29th of August at five hours. So it's only about three days that it's closer than, than it's ever been before. Now, if, because none of us saw the 1924 <coughs> apparition of the planet, it probably means that we've got a bigger span than that. Maybe it, um, some people are looking at it for the very first time. But it's closer to 1924 for only about three days. Surely those sorts of differences though will be imperceptible in terms of arc seconds. Surely those differences there would be imperceptible in terms of arc seconds of apparent time. Oh, it's probably, yeah, they would be. Yeah, that's so. Anyway, we've got to press on. Jean Mears, the um, Belgian mathematician and astronomer who, who actually wrote the book that but a bit of service before, where's it gone? Yeah, down the floor. Behind you. Anyway, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Here you go. He wrote that. Oh, it's on the floor. Astronomical morsels, uh, mathematical morsels in astronomy. Um, he showed that over the over a million, over two million years, that from there to there is one million years, and at the moment we're, we're about here. And these very close oppositions are going to get closer and closer for a couple of thousand years, and then they'll get further and further away again. And you can see that this 60,000 year business that we've been talking about is associated with this part of the, um, the graph here. And there are reasons for that graph. It's, it's a rather complicated setup. But one of the reasons is that the date of opposition is gradually getting later. And this is due to the gradual advance of the perihelion point of Mars. So as well as Mars going around in its orbit, the orbit itself is rotating. And its perihelion point is getting closer to the Earth's furthest point. So Slowly and slowly but surely, the, um, the opposition to getting closer. And in addition to that, because of planetary perturbations, the, um, 
Mars orbit is slowly becoming more elliptical. So its closest point is actually coming closer in and its furthest point is going further out. And uh, for those reasons, we're getting all of these very complicated changes. Now, I very briefly want to talk about where it is, how big will it be, and what we expect to see. Where it is at the moment is um, about, around about there. It's, a, it's approaching what we call the point in the sky where it's stationary in right ascension, and that's another stationary point up there. And after that stationary point, it will start to retrograde. And that's the point where it will start to rise very rapidly each night, very earlier and earlier. You remember that the, um, the stars in the sky rise four minutes earlier each night. At the moment, Mars is travelling backwards in the sky in its normal motion, and it will be rising perhaps three minutes or three and a half minutes earlier each night. But once it retrogrades, it'll come up five or six minutes earlier each night. And it will rapidly do that through, through its opposition time, and then it will reach this other stationary point. And all of this happens in the constellation of Aquarius. And that will be the case up until about the early, early December. And uh, in that time, it'll have, it'll have advanced well over to the west. That's a picture of all the planets showing their actual sizes. And before we spoke about the Earth being about 13,000 kilometres, Mars about 7, 6,700, 6,800 kilometres. And comparing that to Jupiter, which is 143,000 kilometres, the Earth is only one eleventh the size of Jupiter. But in the sky, we don't see them like that, of course, because they're varying distances. And through the telescope, we see these apparent sizes. And instead of talking about their diameters in kilometres, we talk about the diameters in seconds of arc. And uh, Mar uh, Venus is the biggest planet to us, um, apparently to us, I should say. And when it's um, very close, it's, it's greater than one minute of arc in diameter. Jupiter is 45 seconds of arc, and Mars, this time around, is 25.11 seconds. So even though it's a very close opposition, it's still not at, only about 60% the size of Jupiter. This is a comparison at, at, at its most unfavorable point, its superior conjunction. Mars is actually smaller than Uranus. If you've seen Uranus in the sky in a telescope, it's, a, it's only a small planet, and Mars is smaller than that, and it's right <coughs> around the other side of the sun. I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes briefly um, talking about how to find objects on the planet. Um, I've placed this around the, the map and the pages of the ASV book, but um, I presume people have got access to a yearbook of sorts. Mm -hmm. Is it so? It, it's also in Astronomy 2003. Yeah. This page, which is copied out of the Astronomical Almanac, so there's nothing, uh, nothing unique about it, talks about the longitude of the central meridian of Mars. That's the, the title at the top, right? Longitude of the central meridian. Now, before I pointed out that the zero meridian on Mars was this sinus meridiana point, just as it is at Greenwich on the Earth. And that table shows where the, the central meridian is at 10 hours Melbourne time in the morning. That's not hours U2. And if we come down to the 16th of July, We'll find that um, if we can highlight that a little square, the central meridian on Mars is 356.7 degrees. It's almost north degrees. But <coughs> at 10 o'clock this morning, the centre of Mars would have been its meridian 356.7. And we'll, we'll make that a bit bigger so you can read it. Now, what we want to do is try to work out what we're going to see at 9.30 tonight. That's um, that's around about, well, it's in half an hour's time. I tried to pick a time which was close to what we'd be talking at the moment. I didn't know it was going to be on first. <laughs> so 9.30 to 9, we want to work out what we're going to see on Mars from this, um, <coughs> from this table. Now, the well, Lomachina Central Marie, as we've already pointed out, at 10 o'clock this morning was 356.7 degrees. At 9.30 tonight, that's 11 hours 30 minutes past 10 o'clock this morning. Right, we've advanced by 11 hours 30 minutes, and it's this bit at the bottom here that tells us where, 
what we've got to add on. So if we go along to 11 hours, and then down 30 minutes, it comes to a figure that I can't read until I put up the thing here. It, it, it has rotated another 168.1 degrees in that 11 hours, 30 minutes. So if we add on 168 to, to our 356 that we got before, we get 524.8 degrees, which is fairly useless. So we've got to subtract 360 from that to, to get an idea of where it is. And we find that the central meridian at 9.30 to night would be at 164.8 degrees. And a lot of people like to do that because they like to, to have an idea of what they're going to see before they go out and, um, and look through the telescope. Now if we come to a map of Mars, there's north degrees longitude at each end and, and all the others filled in the middle is 180 degrees, 160 degrees. If we put in this 168 degree line and a circle around it, that's the, the central meridian at 9.30 tonight, and it's very, very roughly what we'd see on the planet. Now, that is rough because uh, of various things. The, the map is distorted, right? It's a, it's a flat paper representation of a, of, a, of, a, um, of a round globe. There's also a phase associated with the planet, and it's also tilted. And in the various ephemerides, um, we get pictures like this, and it, it has a moment sort of halfway between those two, and you can see the way, it, what I mean by tilt. Um, the, the South Pole is starting to tilt towards us, so that circle on the map that I just drew is not all that accurate, but it's a guide to see the we're going to see. The phase is also there, because Mars is off to one side of our line of sight. It, it's in dipper shape, and there's the, the, the phase of the planet on the 27th of June, and of course in opposition there will be no phase, because it's directly be, behind us. So the phase at the moment will be sort of halfway between those two. So if we look tonight, at the, in those diagrams south is at the bottom, we see the south pole cap, we see the south pole tilted towards us, and we see a phase so that Mars, at first sight, would, would look quite elliptical. And, until we look at it very closely, we find that one side was round and the other side was cut off by a shadow. So that's, that's, what, we'd, uh, that's what we'd see tonight. One of the things that um, is, is ter ter terribly useful in looking at the planet Mars is the use of filters. Sometimes if you use filters on planets like Jupiter and Saturn, you don't see a lot. But on Mars, the, the um, presentation is outstanding. <coughs> and um, these dark markings on the planet are called albedo features, and they are best seen, or the, the contrast is increased if we use a red filter. And that means that um, what look like hazy little markings should be higher contrast and look quite black. Those numbers there are Kodak photographic filters, and we don't have to use exactly those. All we need is a red filter. To look at the, the, the dust clouds um, and the formation of dust storms, it's best to use a yellowy green filter, perhaps around 58, and the blue filter emphasizes the atmospheric conditions and um, that, that's best seen with a Bracken 47B or, or just a blue filter. That's a picture taken by a friend of mine who just lives a, a street away from me. We correspond every day about Mars and he took that picture on the 29th of May and it shows the very large southern pole cap which I've now put at the top and it also shows a, a dust storm feature just in there. See that? But that's what the pole cap looked like on the 29th of May, and it will, it will, it will um, actually shrink in the next few months. These are some conventional photographs taken by myself in 1986, and that picture there is taken through a Retin 25 red filter, and it shows all the old video features, so then that, that happens to be signs of Meridiana there. So that central meridian would be very close to zero. Taken through the blue filter, at 47B, you can see the South Pole cap as you can on the top diagram, but you can also see the Northern Pole polar hood. That's the North Pole cap starting to form as it enters its winter, and you can also see a lot of haze and fog around the um, around the limb. Now, to look at it visually, the effect of the filter is is as outstanding as that. If you use a blue filter with a telescope, 
Now, one of the markings will disappear, but you'll see all of this hazy, bright spots and things over it, which represent water or carbon dioxide vapour in its atmosphere. So it's well worth having a look through a filter. In 19, oh, sorry, in 2001, Morris took these pictures from the six-inch refractor. That's the composite of them, but you can see the difference of the V stands for vision or, or yellow green. So that's red, yellow, green, and blue. And again, you can see the same effect of being able to see the um, a lot of the atmospheric material in the in the blue filter. But in the red filter, you can see all the, uh, the dark markings at high contrast. <coughs> Just before we met, we leave the um, subject of filters. It's possible to buy some very expensive filters, hundreds, hundreds of dollars each, to get glass filters. Um, but you only need those if you're going to write a scientific paper about the, the work that you're doing. <coughs> if you just want to have a look, it's possible to use just, just ordinary wrapping paper. And I've brought some in to show you. I don't know if you can see it all as well, but uh, that's just what you wrap up Christmas presents with. And that's a, that's a red filter. <coughs> that works very well. And you can buy blue and green and yellow as well in the, in the news agents. So that's... Um, Instead of spending hundreds of dollars on the filter, you should just buy some wrapping paper. You probably have some in the drawer at home anyway, and um, and you can use that. The only problem is if you don't know exactly what it, what its characteristics are, so you can't uh, you can't go off and submit papers to the Royal Society or something like that. <laughs> All the time we've been talking about Mars, the pole pad has been shrinking. It's as we talked about before, it's coming out of its southern winter into spring towards southern summer and that was a picture that I took myself in 1971 were the similar circumstances and I put that in to show that as I mentioned before Mars has a phase and the phase <coughs> is indicated on the diagram at the top there and it means it's, it's more difficult to actually measure the size of the pole cap because some of it's hidden by the phase but if you take that into account the pole cap shrunk in that manner in 1971, and we expect it to do the same thing in, 19, in, th in 2003. But axis there is the um, is the axis is the is the, is the um, extent of the pole cap from the pole. So it was 30 degrees at that time in June, and then it was only 10 degrees by the time it got to September. How do you measure that, Barry? So how do you measure that? Well, I measured it off the photograph, so I just measured it with a ruler. Right. With a pair of dividers. Yeah. But I had to take into account that some of it was missing. Okay. With, with a formula. Mm -hmm. Getting back to the dust storms. The problem with a dust storm is, to see a dust storm, you've got to... Um, it, it, really, it really shows up what you can't see rather than what you can see. And there's some more pictures by Morris in 2001 um, showing a dust storm formation in that region there and further in that region there as well. Now, the trouble with dust storms is that often you can't see features on Mars because of our own atmospheric turbulence. Some nights you look at it and it's turbulent, you can't see a thing. And it's very tempting to say that either there must be a dust storm but that's not often the case. These dust storms usually start after opposition and they sometimes persist for eight or ten months. Sometimes, like in 1956, it started before opposition and it, it obliterated all the markings on the planet for, for about six months, including its closest approach. And that, that would have been very disappointing for the people looking at that. There's some further pictures of a, a dust storm activity in that area there. Um, that's taken by Stephen Buter in, in 2001. This time around, there have been several tries to, for a dust storm to start. And I've showed this picture before, but this is a, a repeat of it. There's the dust storm there, there, and there. And that dust storm did not eventuate. It, it subsided after some time and it's settled down again. And um, all the time there are reports of, uh, of, of the starts of dust storms, um, even at this very moment, but most of them seem to be subsiding. 
Well, on the 28th of August, the planet Mars will be the closest we've ever seen it, and it's, it'll be the closest that we will ever see it. It'll look something like that on that particular night. Um, the features are the features that we'll see, uh, the main dark feature of that um, sinus serenium in that position there, and up at the top there is Olympus Mons, the volcano that we talked about before, that, um, that will also be visible. Not so much the volcano itself, but the atmospheric conditions around it will probably show light cloud formation. So if you've got a good telescope on, on the height of the uh, closest approach, it'll be possible to see Olympus Mons. Okay, that's um, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, presentation. As usual, if uh, if there are any questions, um, can I ask that uh, we ask them over a tea break so we can uh, go and have a bit of a tea break and then uh, back in here at uh, twenty five to ten to continue on. So after the tea break, we'll uh, split into whatever sections we, we wish. There will be a video that will start shortly in, in the library room, and we'll come back in here for, I think we've got Sky for the, the night, uh, Bob, and uh, also some other material that uh, Ian Sullivan and uh, I have got to present as well. Would you like to draw the red for now? Yep, is, is the raffle ready, Roger? Okay, well the raffle's not ready until uh, after the tea break, so we'll draw it after the tea break. Okay, thank you.
kind of sped it back and said, oh, an error occurred and this and that. Oh. So I treated my computer in the usual manner. You didn't kick it. You didn't kick it. They can be very frustrating sometimes. Is that the word? A good vocabulary to do that. But isn't it amazing? You say you puzzle over something, yeah. and then as you say, you find a little you say, "Can you show me how to do this?" Yes. And it's done. One of the signs that you have to find is that a technician used to be a troubleshooter. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is uh, getting ready to be drawn, is it? Okay, well, let, let, let's quickly draw it uh, right now. So we got, uh, we got three. Definitely, because I have 40. Okay. Uh, 15. Oh, oh. oh come on. You can do better than that. Oh, it's fine. Oh. So we got 42 and 15, and the final one was 48. If they're not here, I suggest a redraw. <laughs> Somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so we show one. That's 15. Okay. Uh, 
or something like that. Let me just cover that one up. Well, that, that was the view from inside the Woomera Prohibited Zone for most of those images. Ian Sullivan's one is uh, the one with the prominences, that one there. And I believe he's got some of those for sale tonight. If, uh, if you're interested in getting a copy of that one, of, uh, of that one, which is a very good shot there. And the other ones were ones that uh, I took through my telescope, showing the progression of the eclipse right down to sunset when you have what's called the shark fin sunset as you get the eclipse, uh, eclipse sun actually setting. And those with good eyes I can actually make out a little windmill uh, there uh, actually during the uh, sunset. The other one to show you is the one that my nine-year-old daughter actually took, their first foray into uh, astrophotography with a little uh, handheld instamatic camera going snap snap during the totality. And uh, in numbered order here, this was also at Q37, the moon is going from uh, left, uh, bottom left to top right, and you can see the moon slowly covering up the sun there until you get up to uh, a diamond ring. And it goes into totality, and then coming out the other end, you get the diamond ring on the other side as uh, the moon was moving off. Uh, until you get back to um, uh, very bright. So um, she, she was quite, quite chuffed at that. Next, you know. uh, the other thing that was mentioned last month was um, a, a, an asteroid, minor planet, was going to be passing over Victoria in, and its shadow path was shown as uh, that dark line there. That was Al Kester and that was the one that many of you would have received um, the details on how to observe it um, via a post out that, uh, that we did. Wow. And that was because it could be seen with the eye as well as uh, with binoculars or telescopes. There's another one actually this Saturday, and I'll say a few words about that in a moment. But uh, the results um, very early on were pretty much like this. Uh, since, that time, since this time, more have actually come in. About 100 people uh, ended up trying to see it. Most were thwarted by cloud or fog. Uh, I travelled um, uh, fairly north to north of Seymour and uh, to get out of the fog and uh, my observation is that one there, so the shadow actually missed me. Uh, but um, others across South Australia, Western Australia and especially New Zealand were lucky enough to be in the way of the shadow as it passed over them. And um, this is still very much preliminary, but the dotted lines here are people that were planted out at, at the time. Frankston, to give you an idea, is down around that level. So Frankston missed out on, the, on most of these ones as it came by. However, the shadow shifted by about 25 kilometres south because, uh, remember, they just didn't know um, accurately uh, whereabouts the shadow was. Now, this one that's coming up uh, this weekend is not a naked eye one. You'll need binoculars to actually see it. And there's not going to be enough time, really, to uh, post out predictions. But uh, there is a website for it. And if anyone does wish them particularly posted out, uh, please leave uh, your details with me. And what I'll do is I'll show you where this one is going. And get that into uh, focus. I think that's probably about as good as it's going, uh, going to get. This shows the shadow path. Uh, in this case, this one is going from right to left as the shadow sweeps across uh, Victoria. So you see here, Victoria is that, that triangular shape there. And pretty much if you drive north to anywhere on the um, New South Wales-Victoria border, virtually anywhere across there, you'll be within the shadow path. Uh, Bendigo is just there if you're going up uh, via the Hume Highway. So those that are really keen, and we're talking about here in the early evening, um, sort of of the order of about uh, 6.30 from memory. Uh, 6.45 in the evening, this Saturday evening, if uh, you would wish to do it. It's uh, 36 degrees uh, up, and uh, the name of the asteroid is actually Benjamina, and it was actually named by uh, named for the son of the discoverer of it. And the asteroid is magnitude 14, so you're not going to see it in binoculars. However, the star that you're looking at is magnitude 5.6, so you're very easily going to see that in even an ordinary pair of binoculars. And as you can see here, if you go up to, say, Echuca, you're going to be right on the centre of uh, the shadow line to give you an indication. So the idea is to get observers uh, as much across the shadow line as possible. It passes through South Australia, Western Australia and New Zealand again, just by pure chance. And really, 
um, stars this bright are so rare that you're looking about maybe one in ten years of, uh, of this, so uh, you're not likely to see this again uh, for that time. Now, I actually have star, a star chart of uh, the binocular field to see, and I would encourage uh, anyone to follow the instructions that we sent out for the Alcesta one, but look at this uh, different star instead. And if anyone is interested in participating in that one, please see me afterwards and I'll try and get uh, details to you. Right, well, I might throw over to Bob if uh, he's uh, ready to come up. Mm -hmm. And while he's coming up and setting up, uh, we drew the raffle and 48 and 42 came up. If uh, those who weren't here when we drew it, we should check their raffle numbers, 42 and 48. Yeah, 48. We have a 48, do we have a 42? No, we still don't have a 42. John, would you like to wander next door and see if any of the others uh, there were 42? Which one was drawn first? <laughs> You're here first, go on. <laughs> Take a picture. Oh, well, Okay, um, the planet stuff for the month. Um, guess what? You're not going to see um, Saturn, Venus, or um, Jupiter, particularly Jupiter, after about um, the end of the current month, um, because the little pink one is our rising sun. Venus is really into the sun's glare, well and truly. It is absolutely gone for a little while. It will go into the um, evening sky a, bit, a little bit later on. September. Um, Saturn will be a morning object, but only um, if you're desperate enough from around mid-August onwards. And um, the moon's passing along there, but you ain't going to see it in that scenario. So, okay. For this year, Mercury in the evening sky, okay, and it's a sunny sky at the moment because we're showing the sun there. <coughs> the sky for the month, you've got a good view of it. Mercury is going up at a good, near good vertical path, and that is the best path for the year. Mercury adix, please note. And um, while Jupiter um, descends, there's a bit of a nice image of it. Um, around the 27th or the 28th of July, the current month. So, best evening path for Mercury coming as of uh, tonight and getting better and better until midish to late August. And they're very close to each other, aren't they, too? Well, on, on the sky of the month thing, um, they are reasonably close. Here's mm -hmm. the, the, the image that I built it out mm -hmm. last night. At 11.50 p.m., but it is quite in times. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah, they're sort of close. Mm. But it's just a line of sight thing. Mm. All right? Mm. So, Mercury and Jupiter are being happy with each other at the moment. And um, Mars is getting better, as we all know. Look at that. Wow. Ooh. And I have to say it, but Mars is again being coolest by the full moon. That's mm -hmm. the deep sky observers, constellation Corvus. Okay. Uh -huh. um, so it's not a good idea um, if you really want a really quality view to be looking at Mars when the full moon's near it, roughly now or mid um, August. Because the full moon plays havoc with it nearby. But as I heard someone say, it's one way to find Mars for those mm. idiots that don't know where it is. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Okay, um, the usual nice guy stuff. Um, all our, look, you, you know about that. Um, it's still a good sky north. Stacks of mess, your objects. Um, the uh, moon hanging around there. Um, lots of guide stars for computer telescopes. Um, I'll mention briefly, uh, on Skype of the Month, I've, again, I've repeated myself and gone over the constellation Lyra again, um, but you will need a low, northerly, unpolluted horizon, but it's a lovely small constellation. It's got heaps to look at. And in Vol Peculiar, which I haven't outlined there, you've got the Dumbbell Nebula. Um, both of those are dead easy, even in large binoculars. M27 and M57. Okay. And in the southern sky, um, I didn't have time to put the lines of Grus in, but Grus is on start of the month again. It's it's very easily recognised. Looking clearly, we're looking east southeast. Um, Grus is is very easily picked up. It's top right of Mars. You know, Mars in Aquarius, as Barry mentioned earlier. Um, it's easily picked up by a very bright line of stars there. That is very obvious with Al Nair above it and, um, and, and uh, <coughs> Theta and Iota there. But I did not have time to put the numbers into the database there. <coughs> I'll do it when I've got nothing else to do. Okay, sorry. This next bit is just a, a close-up of Grus. Um, now, that's just that's exactly what you've got on the sky for the month. Um, uh, I better put the lines in it now. Radio. There's the, um, the fairly bright stars: Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Iota, Epsilon, um, and. Just going over it briefly, um, I'll show a blow-up of two objects, or a couple of double stars. Um, the interesting thing with Gruss is that um, you've got three uh, double stars, um, Mu and Delta and Pi. Now, all of those are visually they are totally unrelated, but Delta has got a companion Pi there, it's unrelated, but the components are true binary systems, so it's a bit, it's a bit weird. The scarf of the month covers it. And um, the brightest galaxy is that, and you can't miss it, because it's close to El Nair, if you're lucky, to see it out of the brightness of the star. The next brightest would be um, that one there, 7410, which I'll show you in a second. Um, there are a few other tidbits on the chart, on the scarf of the month, that you can sort of muck around with. At your pleasure. And when it reaches culmination, it um, takes that um, position. That's that's the position that you would see in books at culmination. Okay. So we shall do a little exit and just have a look at um, the ring nebula, which I have done before. Okay. Right. Zero. Without the stuff, bigger. Um, down there is a double double, but that's not of concern now. Um, that's where the ring nebula is. A little bit of a blow up. Okay. Um, and you won't see it without large binoculars. <coughs> okay, small telescope. You, you might see it with 15 by 80s anyway. Um, that's where it is. You cannot miss it. Um, there's the same line of the constellation, and it's basically almost dead way, dead way between um, both blue stars. And you can use that white star to sort of double check, but it's, it's, it's easy, it's just a lovely smoke ring. Um, notice on Sky for the Month, I've mentioned that Gamma there may appear um, slightly disky and, and, and fuzzy in a high power. Wouldn't mind checking that out myself. 
Um, multiple star there, I think beta. And um, the rest is up to you. Um, close up. Oh, there's a possible double star nearby. That was the one. Um, that one up just below the name. That, that's a possible double star there. Probably just an optical thing. Okay, enough of that. Very, very quickly, the Dumbbell Nebula. This is a bit, it doesn't have terribly many reference stars near it. Um, I'll just briefly mention that um, it's around that area. Oh, I'll just go one step further, I think. Okay. Um, I think <coughs> it's, it's found using a little equilateral triangle of stars, and I think one of those is 13 Sagitta, I think. But a computer telescope or a bit of star hopping using another chart would help. And that's the Dumbbell Nebula, and it's very obvious. Okay, now, Southern Sky, which concentrates on Bruce, the new double. Um, this is what happens when you do things a bit wrong. Um, okay, that's the line of Bruce going straight up. Um, the unrelated double stars are, that's Pi, Delta, <coughs> 1 and 2, and Mu. Um, nothing exciting about Mu, it's just two yellow stars, if I can get that thing to work. They're just totally unrelated. There is a companion star with the red one, but unfortunately I didn't centre that, so I redid it, and I'll just show you that, it looks a lot better. That's the second one here, using delta as the centre rather than mu. Constellation shows up better too. Now, with the red one there, okay, we're leaving mu. That's just a lovely line of sight, double star. Um, the red one has a real companion that's light red and magnitude 9. So let's see if we can get it. See how it's nudging out there? And... There you go. So that's a real companion within the unrelated optical double. Okay, one to go, and that's the Galaxy 7410. Um, it's visible in the 4-inch telescope, so I've chucked it in. Um, the other one, 7213, near near should be dead easy. I mean, it's near a bright star, you should be able to get it. Okay. I think it's, I've nicknamed it the Star Galaxy, you'll see it in a minute. Um, I think one of those is Theta Gruis. It's on the chart anyway, it's identified. And with, with large binoculars, you might pick it up, but it's a cigar shape. And through your finder, you've got a lovely asterism virtually pointing to it. What more could you want? And if you put a red filter on, you'll see that red star. <laughs> okay, and if you magnify it further, it just reverses that scenario. Okay, I just nicknamed it the Cigar Galaxy. That's the 7410. So, that's it.
Now, I've heard of Cassini. Cassini was Italian, but he worked in Paris, the Paris Observatory, which uh, was a little earlier than Greenwich. <coughs> uh, and it was the premier observatory of the world, actually, in the late 1600s. Anyway, these are the first drawings. Uh, these are drawings by uh, service major, and these, the bigger features on Mars, possibly that's what he got hold of. But, um, there was no talk of canals and things in those days. But just shows you anyway, the drawings of Mars go back a long way. All right, next one. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I forward. I the idea is to go forward. But I think you better have some practice a little bit. Tell him to do it himself. Yeah, yeah, do it yourself. Yeah. Now focus. There we go. You sure? Yeah, that's oh, right. Uh, right. And you see this guy, it even tells you how to pronounce his name. Barry didn't mention Schiaparelli. He was a forerunner of, of, uh, of Percival Lowell. Now, Barry did mention, though, in 1877 there was a opposition of Mars, which was a very close opposition. And there was a discovery owing to that. Anybody know what that discovery was? Historic discovery. What goes around planets? Moons. moons. What are the moons of Mars? Phobos, Phobos and Deimos. And they were discovered in 1877. Anybody know where? <coughs> who? They were discovered in America at the Washington Naval Observatory by Hall, by Asaph Hall. But the opportunity was there back in Melbourne. The Great Melbourne Telescope was functioning at that time, but it was down, I think, at the, the, at the crucial moment. All these opportunities are lost. You imagine it could have been discovered back in Melbourne. Imagine, imagine if it had been. History would have been different. So anyway, they picked up those two, two, uh, two moons. Schiaparelli started off with a, quite a credit to his name. He discovered Hesperia when he was only 26. Won prizes, became an expert on comets, meteoroids. Now he's named director of the Milan's, Milan Observatory. 1877 came up and he thought he saw canals. And this canal observing was catching because he passed it on. Next. This is some of his drawings, 1877 to 1879. Lake of the Sun, Solis Lake, be a true lake. Yeah. Anyway, these, these are the sorts of drawings, and these definite, he thought, anyway, canals. And he passed it on, the next slide, passed it on, oh, here's another one, Martian canals. And even named them. Huh? Mare, see, which good to catch from the moon. The moon, Mare, on the moon, the, the uh, features on the moon. And he doesn't actually name any of the well-known pictures, does he, on Mars? Anyway, uh, is there life on Mars? Now, of course, it's only one step to go further, to, to see the lines, claim their canals, and if they're canals, canals are a man-made object, therefore, something on Mars, some life on Mars would create these canals. That's how the reasoning goes. Next. And this fellow, Camille Flammarion was a popularizer of astronomy in France. He was a sort of Patrick Moore of France of, uh, back in the 1880s. And he wrote many books, and some of his books, of course, were translated into English, and you can still get them. Still, the Flammarion Book of Astronomy was quite a popular book for many, many years. Anyway, he got onto the bandwagon, the, the canals bandwagon, and popularized it, and uh, that's another reason why it kicked on. It wasn't just one person. One person with a reputation can get something started. Somebody else with a reputation joins in. And on we go. Next. Are these tube-shaped things that microfossils uh, that in this book uh, mention that they think they're uh, organisms from Mars. These are sort of uh, what you have to find to be life. These, these things here, there's argument about the fact that they could have been like, they look these, uh, 
microfossils. I'll mention a bit more about this next month. I'll do a bit more on Mars next month. Leave, leave it now. Next. Uh, now, what happened is Percival Lowell joined in and took Schiaparelli's ideas and drew his own map, observed, thought he was going to see canals, and lo and behold, he did. And you see, he's got names and things all over his drawing. Uh, they presented, this is a model he made up, like you have moon globes, this is a model he made up of Mars, and his staff presented it to him, and here is a picture of him doing his garden that they put on the model and presented it to him, I think it was some for a gift for his 50th birthday in 1905. But bear, bear in mind that he was next. Is he what he on Mars? Uh, <laughs> he was a he, he made enough money in his twenties to last him the rest of his life. Uh, I think he came from a wealthy family, had a good start, and got to be in charge of things, and uh, then decided what would he do with his money and his time. He did an astronomy course back in the 1870s, but didn't get involved in astronomy straight away. He went to Japan and Korea and the Far East. In China, wrote books about these things, and he was quite a, a lecturer, quite a, a personal fellow, also quite a gifted writer, and he wrote a number of books, which are not still in print, but, but nevertheless he wrote them and they were read at the time. And he gave lectures, and this book illustrates the fact that about 1906 he was giving lectures, he'd had a thousand people would had come to a hall, and they'd he'd fill every seat. And he'd give a lecture about the canals of Mars and whatever. Because in those days there was no television, um, there was no movies, or not to speak of. So it was the age of people like him, like Mark Twain. People had a big name, and they could stand up before an audience and uh, and get them in. Next. Now, back in those days of Schiaparelli, Schiaparelli, and and <coughs> They wouldn't have had pictures like these. This is dry riverbeds on Earth, and you see the dry riverbeds on Mars that have been seen recent times. They wouldn't have had any of that genuine article, but you can see there is similarity, there is some similarity. So to actually state that what you see on Mars means that there was life. But, but Percival Lowell drew conclusions like gravity on Mars is like three-eighths of what it is on Earth, surface gravity, therefore there will be characters walking around Mars which would be 20 feet tall based on this, this idea that gravity is less therefore people will grow taller. All sorts of descriptions <laughs> on that. Percival Lowell had enough money to set up an observatory of his own and employ astronomers. And In those days uh, there weren't so many jobs for astronomers. Very often the jobs came from patronage of people like Lowell. Unusually, Lowell himself was an astronomer. Some of these patrons that set up observatories weren't astronomers themselves. They just wanted to see it done and wanted to see their names up. Next. And there's an article. This is New York Times. Mars inhabited, says Professor Lowell. <laughs> Declares the planet to be the abode of intelligent, constructive life. This is the New York Times. All the news that's just the print. <coughs> 1907. Uh, 1907. August 1907. Changes in canals confirmed. That's it, conf that's it, that's it. Changes in canal confirmed former theory. Splendid photograph were obtained. In answer to a request from the editor of Nature, authoritative statement of the observations of Mars made during 1907 opposition, Professor Lowell communicates to the publication described as two or three of the most important results of change. The planet is presently voted intelligent. Yes, and it goes on and on. Yeah, constructed. Yeah. Well, you see, it, it, and see, even staff at his observatory uh, were a bit sceptical, and he actually fired one of the astronomers. Uh, uh, didn't pay to disagree with him, and and he, uh, of course, went on and on. And, and there were notable astronomers like Barnard, who just said he never saw canals. But there were one or two others who did. No, the, the question was it, was, it was open and it made an interesting lecture, so he did and got away with it. Now, you heard of H.G. Wells, the, the, uh, the writer. 
he was uh, the great science fiction writer of the early 20th century. He wrote War of the Worlds in 1898, and that was published, and it was made into a movie, and that came on later. I think we've got another another one, next one. Uh, but, well, there's some pictures that from Lowell Observatory took these eight photographs of Mars between 1907 and 1956. See what we'll look. This was virtually after these lectures he was giving in the early 1900s, but he never actually, I don't think he ever got up and said, I was wrong. These canals just sort of faded away, and Lowell himself died in 1916. The observatory went on, but sort of dropped Mars and went on to finding another planet. And they were successful, of course. The, Plu the planet Pluto was discovered in 1930 at the Lowell Observatory. And he was, uh, it kept the, the name of the observatory, and it, it's done some good work since. Well, you see, it's doing this sort of thing, taking these photographs. So the Lowell Observatory goes on with a 24 inch refractor and uh, uh, with genuine astronomy. It was just one of those things that was, was uh, latched onto and uh, was a, obviously a bum steer. Next. Uh, you've heard of Thomas Edison, the great inventor of the light bulb. Well, I've never imagined that he got into movie making and made a 1910 a film, A Trip to Mars. And this was a Martian in Thomas Edison's film. So there are lots of people getting on the bandwagon. H.G. Uh, Wells' novel, which made into a film, was about spacecraft that come, came to, to uh, the world, and they uh, they um, wreaked havoc for about a, a week until they all started crashing everywhere. And the reason was that the Martians couldn't uh, couldn't survive without diseases. The diseases on Earth, there are enough bacteria to knock them, and they didn't have resistance against it, and so all crashed, all the, it all came to nothing. But all the guns and bombs and things they tried on, on them all failed. Next. Uh, and these are pictures of the dust storms that Barry was talking about, dust storms on Mars. Um, 1973 dust storm on Mars. There's a bit here. And these are low observatory photographs. Right next. And what are these? Martian features, amateurs of 1994 95, and a one inch fire. And this was in Sky and Telescope. They're pretty clear images, aren't they? Pretty good. Uh, right next. Right, I go to light. I just, just, well, I'll just read this one little bit here in the book. Um, this book is about the story of of, uh, of science fiction, some of the science fiction. It said, perhaps the weirdest Martian movie begins with Earth scientists decoding a, ra a radio signal from the Red Planet that provides the film's title, Mars Needs Women. <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, this chilling warning proves true for, for their civilization threatened by a shortage of females. Five Martians come to kidnap five Earth women and take them to their planet. The alien plan succeeds until one of them dot, falls in love with the intended victim, space scientist Dr. Marjorie Bolland. In this 1968 feature's best scene, Dot and Mr. Dr. Bolland go to a planetarium show about Mars. When the tape recorded lecture breaks down, Dot takes over and tells the audience, Mars the one planet that shows evidence of being habitable. Mars has polar caps over North and South Poles. Between these polar caps, one of the biggest controversies about Mars is the crisscrossing of canals. Many believe that these canals are part of a vast irrigation system, but the water is pumped from the polar caps to supply the needs of the rest of the planet. Yes, the conditions for life do exist on Mars, but unless it can renew itself, the first Earth explorers will find only sad remnants of a civilization that is brighter than that of Earth, um, but that may turn to dust. At that moment, Dr. Bolland realises that Dot is a Martian, but she doesn't care. She loves him. At the time that Mars needs women the food, Dot must decide whether to return to Mars with his companions or remain on Earth with the woman he loves. 
Never saw it. Finally, anybody saw the movie? 1968, it was. Right, last call for number 42. Uh, otherwise, we'll draw another one. Yes, we yeah. draw another one. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, then uh, where's Roger got? Oh, he's, he's got everything. He's got out with the tickets. He's got out with the tickets to substitute his own in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, what we'll do is we'll uh, keep that one for next next month's raffle prize in that case, as, as we've lost all the raffle season. Well, yeah, we're easy people find him. Uh, yeah. Two prizes, we only have to give two prizes, don't we? A correction to what was advertised in Scorpius, the next, next month's talk is not actually Peter Norman. Peter's talking in September. Next month is uh, one that Ian has arranged, Dr. Alan Ford from uh, Monash Uni. She'll be coming down to talk about what the stars are made of. All gone. All gone? Yeah. Um, he's got the keys, I think, hasn't he? No, no, no. Oh, the tickets have gone. Oh, the gone. tickets are all gone. <coughs> all is, uh, did anyone stick their head outside at uh, tea break to uh, see what the weather was like? Clearing it's clearing up. Uh, was there a desire by anyone to go to the Briars and actually try and have a look at Mars? No? That's easy. I'll go for anyone else. Is it milk? Okay, so, so Paul has actually offered to, to go if uh, anyone wishes to go, go to the Briars up to the site to see Mars. And. Uh, uh, one last thing, uh, two aurorae were actually seen a few weeks ago. Uh, one was actually noticed from Frankston, it was an orangey colour with rays up to 30 degrees altitude just after midnight. And the next was spotted uh, at Hastings as uh, pinks, reds and pulsing vertical rays. Uh, the aurora network worked reasonably well, but not, uh, not perfectly on that one. There was also an aurora alert last Saturday night as well. Uh, I was looking at Mars till about 2 o'clock in the morning when we didn't see anything, but uh, I don't know if anyone else did. Uh, also, what, one thing I did mention when I was showing the results of that Alkesta asteroid occultation, if there was anyone here who tried it but was beaten by cloud or fog, please let me know uh, because I will add, add your location, name and whatever instrument you use to the list. Because even though you're clouded out, um, and you, your observation obviously can't contribute to knowing the shape of the asteroid. Um, they, they're very keen to know in New Zealand and the USA where you are actually located on the globe should another one ever come by. So please, please let me know. It was Greg, Greg Walton. Yeah, you were observing oh, at home. Each, to have a look at it over the bay, it was completely clouded out. Yep. So. Yeah, me too. And St Stan, you, you were as well? Yeah. Just at 46, which you said to be about the zero, it shot down by a week. No, I didn't notice where I was. Was, was there anyone else that tried it to put some paper out? Okay, yeah. and... Yeah. Was quite yeah. out. All right, well, after the meeting, come down and tell me where, where you were, and I'll, I'll note that down rather than holding it myself.